Welcome to The Bridge, the official podcast for the University of Maryland Baltimore School of Pharmacy Patients Program. The Patients Program is the bridge between the community and researchers. The Patients Program created this partnership to help researchers listen to the community's voice in order to build a bridge to an effective learning healthcare community. Here's your host, Rodney Elliott. Hello everyone, welcome to The Bridge. I'm Rodney Elliott, the Community Engagement Specialist for the Patients Program. And today we have an exciting show, um, a session talking to some friends near and dear to me about an awesome cause. And um, it's gonna be very information driven, powerful information that's near and dear to me as a Baltimore native, University of Maryland graduate, a sports guy all my life, um, a parent of sports uh, kids. I got I coached before, and um, this is something that has affected me as a, again, like I said, University of Maryland graduate, but just a Baltimore guy and a, a fan of sports, and I know it's near and dear to our listeners as well. So, again, I'm Rodney Elliott, but today I'm here with Martin McNair. I call him Marty. He's a good friend of mine. And then I'm here with David Johnson. These guys work with the Jordan McNair Foundation. Marty is the founder. Him and George's mom started this back in 2018, following the untimely death of their beloved son, Jordan Martin McNair. His death was a result of a heat stroke, and he suffered during an organized off-season team workout. He's going to tell you a little bit about how he started, why he started it, and where they are now. And another good friend of mine, David Johnson, he's a community engagement manager with the Jordan Manette Foundation. Um, I spoke to David before in another role, uh, but today I think it's going to be powerful to see how he assists and how he helps out there at the Jordan McNair Foundation. So um, I want to welcome them to the show. Marty, David, how are you guys doing? Great. Thank you for having me, Rodney. Well, sure. Thanks for having us on. Good to see you again, Rodney. No problem. Glad to see you. Glad to see you. This is all audio, so David, I'm glad your camera is not on because the shirt you have on right now, I don't know why you chose that shirt this morning, but you know what? It is what it is. We're here and back. It was clean and it matched. <laughs> you like it. I love it. You like it. I love it. Um, I'm going to dive right in here, man, with the uh, with our conversation today. Marty, you started a foundation because the untimely death of your son, George McNair, can you talk a little bit about the George McNair Foundation, um, you know, how it started and, uh, you know, what 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 led you to do that shortly after the passing of your son? Yeah, thanks for having me, Rodney. So most people that um, that may know our story, literally, uh, Jordan was a uh, if you're a sports fan, you should know our story. But um, basically, if you don't know our story, basically, uh, it, it was a. Uh, uh, Jordan had a heat stroke on the very first day of football practice. Uh, he was a sophomore at the University of Maryland, a sophomore football player at the University of Maryland. Um, and the interesting thing for us was, you know, really, I had no idea anything about heat stroke. Uh, I was not as knowledgeable uh, back then as I am today in regards to the, um, the actual uh, heat related injury process or that particular space. Um, man, life kind of changed for us when, uh, and I usually tell people the last time I talked to Jordan was May 28th of 2018. Mm -hmm. It was basically like, hey, son, typical father and son conversation. Son, no practice starts tomorrow. Uh, man, have a good day. I'll talk to you later on in the week. And, you know, as always, I always finished every conversation off with always wear your protection. And um, that was the last time he and I spoke, you know, verbally one on one. Or, or to one another and then the next day we got a call uh from the campus police officer at the university of maryland uh, uh from the university of maryland he said basically like uh mr McNair, you know there's been an incident on the field jordan had a seizure so at that time you know you can imagine he said we were at this particular hospital so at that particular time you know i was already out the door and route to get tanya jordan's mom but the interesting thing was you know me not but being a panic button pusher it was a guy that was, I mean, healthy as a horse, literally hadn't been in the hospital since the time he was born, mm -hmm. right? And so when you said seizure, you know, I, I'm like, uh, that could be anything. However, but, you know, he's a healthy guy. 
Um, I didn't start asking questions until I walked into the ER. Of course, you want to know what happened. And then to the athletic trainers at that particular time, I was just asking, hey, had this ever happened? I either one of you. I still don't even know what happened at this point. So we literally went from a healthy kid Tuesday morning to an emergency liver transplant Friday morning with 85% of Jordan's liver being in the necrosis. So basically what that means is, you know, his liver was dead. And you can imagine as a father or a parent, like what the heck just happened between Tuesday morning and now where somebody's liver can be 85% dead at that point. What had happened was, and at that particular time, I didn't know anything about a heat stroke. And I'm using the term heat stroke loosely because I just thought that, you know, if you had any type of heat related injury, you basically just got to some shade and some water, um, got to some, got to some shade, drank some cold water, and you know all would be right with the world. Um, I had no idea that you know anything. If that person's core body temperature hadn't cooled down within 20 to 30 minutes, you know obviously you'd end up with a result of a person's liver being 85 percent necrosis, um, and mm. you know in that time space. So the interesting thing was, you know what a lot of people really don't know about heat stroke is. Uh, heat stroke is the equivalent of your body being in a microwave oven. So when your core body temperatures reaches 104 degrees, uh, it's the equivalent of it being in a microwave oven. You have a 20 to 30 minute window to cool it down. And unfortunately, Jordan got they got Jordan to the uh, ER at an uh, hour and 43 minutes later with a core body temperature of 106 degrees. So that's how we went from healthy kid Tuesday morning to 85% of his liver being in the necrosis Friday morning. And he was within hours of his life. And that was the conversation that we had uh, with the doctors, when they, uh, organ transplant doctors. It was like, mom and dad, if we don't make it, if you all don't make a decision right now, Jordan would be dead within 12 hours. So at that particular time, it was just like, hey, you know what, let's do what we got to do. Still not really realizing the magnitude. Obviously, we saw the magnitude of it. But one of the main things, Rodney, for me was as a father and as a parent, you know, when that, whenever anything goes wrong, with your child, you always assume full responsibility. And it's like, what did I miss? And I kept asking myself, I obviously missed something. Did I miss it while they were, while they were uh, sit, while the coaches at that from Maryland were sitting at our, our kitchen table uh, a few days before, you know, signing his letter of intent or signing his letter to commit, you know, like I missed something. And then another question we kept asking ourselves was like, if we don't know these things, how many other parents in America don't know these things about any heat related injuries? I had no idea that they could be fatal. And the interesting thing for that was, for me was, I had no idea of any of the stats at that particular time. I didn't know about the 30, the, the 29 kids that had died since 2000, since the year 2000 in the NCAA. I had no idea of all the high school kids that had passed. I had no idea of all the youth kids that had passed. So like literally at that time, like, you know, really we had no idea on any statistics from a national perspective. Um, however, at that particular time, our main focus was just really trying to get through this. You know, and I was like the total optimist. A parent's love is, is uh, man, a mother's love is one thing, but a father's love is equally just as strong because, you know, literally, I knew that we weren't going to play football anymore. However, I knew that we would survive this. I knew right. it was going to be a very, very arduous task on the, on the recovery process. But, you know, I knew that we would have a story to tell. And um, unfortunately, I just think that so much damage was done that it was just the liver, the liver repay alone wasn't the equivalent of just putting some new batteries in a in a in a, in a transistor radio, and that was going to make everything right. You know, unfortunately, it was so much other damage. And um, I had already had a history of uh, advocacy, um, so for me, it was like really when you guys were talking about podcasts, I actually was doing a podcast at that particular time. I just was a reentry advocate. So it was interesting because like all this stuff I had already been working on anyway. So the trajectory when Jordan passed, it was just somewhat, I'm not going to say relatively easy, but it was something that I was really passionate about. Like right. really, how do we turn this pain into some type of purpose? Because man, just the, it, you know, losing a child um, is, man, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. And it's just uh, indescribable feeling like you can't even put in the words. It hurts so bad. And I knew that if I didn't get in front of it, you know, obviously, you know, grief would have consumed me and just really kind of taken us into a rabbit hole of despair. And I just didn't want to go that route. Kudos to you and to all your you. parents for yep. uh, figuring out a way to, like you said, like you said, turn that pain into a purpose. Correct. Um, you know, I've heard the story before I had a chance to look at your website and sort of story some more, but even listening to you now talking about it, it's unimaginable. 
unimaginable. Yeah, I can't imagine that from that phone call to driving up from Tuesday to Friday, all yeah. that transition. You and you threw out some words and some stats. Talk about liver necrosis. You talk about if it's eighty five percent. You talked about uh, you know eighty five percent of the liver is basically bad. Then you're talking about. Um, you know, your body temperature, if it's over 104 degrees, 30, these are a lot of stats and numbers that people typically don't know. No, no. Like, that, that's not common. Not at so, all. And with the patient program, we deal with a lot of doctors and researchers, and they talk about a lot of different numbers and languages and stuff like sure. that. When you experienced <laughs> when you were starting it, the podcast, how important were the researchers and the doctors to helping you and Tanya and your staff understand the importance of like knowing how we got there and, and knowing what to look for. So how, how important were the researchers in this process for you? Man, I'm going to be honest, you know, the researchers really didn't like say, for instance, I know like when this was going on, they had what they call a pink book when you're at the ICU. And when they, they had, they had a, 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 a publication where they talked about um, heat related injuries. Right. And the interesting thing when they were talking about that, that was basically the lamest terms version of what I gave you. When your core body temperature goes above 104 degrees, that's the equivalent of it being in a microwave oven. So at the end of the day, man, like I had to really get like a really, really quick uh, expedited education on the liver. I mean, the liver does over 300 different processes in the body, functions in the body. You know, the liver is just as equivalent as significant as the heart, you know? So again, all this stuff was coming at me very fast, but the main thing was, I had to find out what was going on with my son before I let somebody else tell me, because if you look at it from a medical perspective and you just said, when you, I deal with researchers, I deal with medical doctors, man, I got a medical advisory board full of them. Yeah. And the interesting thing is where our strength as an organization is or a grassroots organization, we speak in layman's terms because see a lot of times what happens when you're looking at, you know, medical researchers and doctors, yeah, they all talk about safety. But again, we talk over people's heads sometimes because, man, it was numerous occasions where I would have to tell a nurse or a doctor, like, like slow down. I didn't go to medical school with you. Give this to me in a way that I can understand it. Right. And really, that's became that's become one of the foundation strengths that even when we sit in, we talk about heat related injuries and things like that. We give it to people in the way that, look, I didn't go to medical school. I'm just smart enough to know that, surround myself with medical professionals to the point where I can, I can, um, uh, uh, I don't want to use the term regurgitate, but I can deliver that same yeah. message. I understand what they're saying just because I've been around it. We got 30, um, 30, 30 um, um, knowledge and we got practical knowledge of this as well. But again, I can deliver it to the average layman. And that's where a lot of times that's the disconnect between, you know, the researchers and doctors versus everyday people in the sense that this is happening to. Believe me, we know that a whole lot here in the patients program. Sure, of course. One thing we pride ourselves on is, again, bringing it to them in the language that they understand. Um, sure. Bringing it to them in the way they understand so they can digest it, so they can exactly, it, and then also be open to questions. So, Dave, I'm going to bring you in on the conversation. Um, as the community engagement manager with the foundation, talk to me a little bit about what your like your role within the program, but also how important it is for you to be that connector, that glue to um, folks who may not be as familiar with the message or the mission of the Jordan McNair Foundation. So thanks for having us again, Rodney. Um, great to be here. Like Marty said, um, you know, he is he's really the one that kind of, you know, is able to convey that message to the layman or to the parent. My role is more delivering that same message to the youth. Gotcha. And so I know you saw that great sweatshirt Marty's wearing that has the acronym Kobe on it. Kobe stands for keep on believing in yourself. Mm. And that is what we, you know, try to instill in the youth, a, a sense of belief, not so much in their ability as athletes, but also in the importance of being able to advocate and speak up for themselves. Um, you know, a coach is gonna know when you're loafing and you're not giving your all, but when you're in pain, you know, when you're suffering mentally, you know, psychologically, you have to have the ability and the courage to speak up. And so that's that's really my role is to kind of develop the curriculum and the language around how we can empower our student, student athletes to advocate and speak up for themselves. Um, and so that's that's really what I, my primary focus is outside of, you know, looking for speaking engagements for us to get involved in, you know, such as this podcast and others. But just to make certain that our young student athletes they know how to speak up for themselves and how to do it in a way where it's respectful, but also where their needs are being met and, and where they can get the services that they need 
um, as well as the attention and the help if they need it. <laughs> oh, man, I like that a lot, man, because um, students or young student athletes in general sometimes feel like they have to run through a brick wall when it comes to training. Right. Um, you know, no matter what sport it is, when it comes to training, you feel like, okay, the coach said, let's do this. Or, you know, the team said, we got to run this. But if you just don't have it or just ain't feeling that day, it's okay to say that because you just don't know what could happen or don't know what the results could be. And don't get me wrong. We want to be in best shape of our life. We want to strive, but it's always a next day. Like, look, just figure out a way to get to that next day. And, um, I'm pretty sure that that's a message that's definitely beneficial to the youth because not only do the coaches, like most of the time it's one, two coaches to a team, but it's way more players than coaches. So if the coaches or the players can recognize something's going on, then I think that's a benefit too as well to the team and say, hey, look, coach, so-and-so over here not looking right or so-and-so right. ain't got it. Like, can you can, can we hold up? Can we get a little water or, or can we get a break? I know that's important too. That's important. Yeah. Player safety is a team effort. So, you know, of course we want to get our parents, you know, knowledgeable about what it is that they should be asking, um, you know, knowing what signs and symptoms to look for, knowing what safety equipment should be on the field, not just at games, but also at practices because the majority of these injuries, they happen during conditioning and workout season. They happen in practice and not necessarily during games, but also making certain that our student athletes know what to look for. Because as you said, you know, it might be one coach or two coaches if you're lucky and no athletic training on site. So if they know what to look for in regards to what type of injuries are taking place, be it a heart injury or a head injury, you know, knowing to look for an AED or what that even is, or knowing that, you know, the cold water tub needs to be, you know, within three minutes of the playing field or the practice area, you know, 90 seconds in, 90 seconds out. If the student athletes know this, if the coaches know this, if the parents know this, then we can do a better job of making certain that when these injuries or when these emergencies happen, we're able to take the correct steps to get players, you know, the attention that they need um, and to make certain that we don't lose anyone. And if we do have a situation where there is an emergency, they get the proper treatment. Hey, hey Rodney, let me jump in as well on that because one of the main things that you just said, man, and like I said, you know, really at that time, you know, I literally blamed myself and I kept asking myself, like, what did I miss? And one of the things that I missed, man, you know, I look, I take it all the way back. Like I'd always told Jordan, you know, to stand up for himself, fight for himself, you know, always be a leader, never a follower. So again, I gave Jordan some of the best, you know, some fatherly advice that I didn't get growing up. But one of the main things that I emphasize the parents is I always taught Jordan how to be coachable. And yep. that was his downfall because at the end of the day, that's why, you know, we came up with a program like Kobe because our main focus is student athlete self-advocacy. Because the thing is, man, it was like, I always taught Jordan to be coachable from a perspective of, you know, if coach tell you to do something, you do whatever coach says. Yeah, at the end of the day, and that's basically create, creating a robot. So what you do is, what I realized was, we got to go back to parents when the kids are small to teach them if they don't feel uncomfortable. Because a lot of times, man, you know, that's easier said than done if a kid or a student athlete is already locked in to, yep. you know, everybody think they're going to go play at the professional level anyway. But once they locked and loaded, man, you know, that's kind of a lost cause or a lost message in a sense. So one of the things that I realized was like, man, that's what I miss. You know, I'd always told him, like I said, to do all these things around his peers, stand up for himself, fight for himself, all these things. However, I never taught him to do that around adults. You know, if a coach made him feel uncomfortable, don't do it. If a coach made him feel or an adult in general, even acts, you know, made him feel uncomfortable to speak up on it or tell somebody about it. And that was really one of the things that I realized, like, that's what I didn't teach him. Now, I don't know, you know, if it would have made a difference at that stage, because a lot of times when you're at the collegiate level, you know, you can already, it's closer than it's further away in the sense versus them being at a youth level, because, you know, we already know the percentages are what the percentages are, but it's like that, that brass ring. Everybody feels that they can attain it because if you got two, three kids or two, three guys from your, from your team and you know they trying out or you know they walking on in the league and stuff like that you know that thing is almost right there in the center. and so you know but again i think it always goes back to we have to create we, we can't create coachable kids only we have to create kids student athletes at an early age that can advocate for themselves i like that approach man and i know you haven't heard this before but i, mean, I know you have heard this before but 
definitely don't need to beat yourself up about that situation, man, because you're oh, yeah. Thank you. a yeah. coachable yeah, yeah, yeah. kid, man, to be coachable. That is definitely something that we all want as a coach, and we all want our players to be like that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, back to David, when you were talking about the AAD and, you know, we talked about the um, – uh the, the 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 cold tubs i was reading a little bit more about something i didn't know about most I, I did find out about it recently with pretty sure everybody saw what happened in the nfl with buffalo what an eap was an emergency action plan so maybe both of you guys can weigh in on this um i'm gonna go back to marty first and come to you dave the eap is something that oh my god that i didn't i after understanding what it is i knew what it was but i just didn't know how valuable that is and, 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 and how important that is to have. Obviously, the NFL, the NBA, the big leagues have it. But when it comes to your colleges or maybe your, your, your high schools or your youth programs, um, how receptive was the sports community, Marty, to understanding how important it was to have EAP programs in process or in, in line with your youth programs? Well, hey, Ronnie, let me tell you, man, one of the main things for us was – when Jordan first passed, I didn't need, it took me, it took me four years to see the value of our emergency action plan, gotcha. right? Literally about three and a half to four years. Now, I'm going to tell you what our process was. Initially, I always thought that it was all about cold water tubs, right? And we donated 300 cold water tubs back in 2019, the programs literally from Alaska to Florida, right? And so that was, that was youth programs, high school programs? Whomever, whomever, high school, college, if you needed a cold water tub, I think I put it on Twitter by mistake. And uh, <laughs> man, people were calling me across the nation. We were giving free tubs away. A logistical nightmare, but we got it done. Gotcha. But the point is, kids kept dying. So I kept saying, man, what is it? You know, it's not about cold water tubs, right? Obviously, it's not about safety equipment. Then I kept saying like, okay, man, I'm talking to all these schools. And um, clearly, man, like, well, what's making anything I say stick once I leave? So I'm like, wow, now it's about legislation. So we got legislation passed, right? We started getting some bills passed. We've gotten four laws passed in the state of Maryland from the AU level to the collegiate level all around student athlete safety. Then I realized kids kept dying across the nation. We don't hear about them because they're not in our geographical area. But rest assured, kids keep dying, I mean, from sports-related injuries. Then I finally realized that maybe in that three-and-a-half to four-year mark, and I realized, like, man, it's the emergency action plan. Because, see, what people don't understand is that's the least common denominator in all these deaths across the nation. See, the thing about DeMar Hamlin is this, man. Now everybody saw what it looked like. Everybody so saw what it looked like on the big now stage, football. I got you. Exactly. But in reality, even though the probably 85% of the people that were looking at it didn't know what they were looking at. However, my 81-year-old mother always ask what I do and I'm, I try to explain every now and then but even she saw the magnitude of it because she saw how quick they responded and unfortunately you know that Tuesday morning I talked to a lot of families that's in our network you know of uh, we call our network uh, uh, the club no parent wants to be a part of or the fraternity no, no father wants to be a part of so I got to deal with all of the people that are living that nightmare because in the real world it don't happen like that see in high school in high school programs, you know, if they don't have the resources um, to do that, you know, again, it don't happen like that. You know, like David said, that 90 seconds, the thing that increased DeMar Samuel's chances for life or his 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 chances statistically for him to survive was the the, the um, quickness of the, how quick they got to him and see an emergency action plan. The thing is, all schools, I mean, all schools should have them, whether it's high school, colleges, um, they should have them. However, a lot of times what the common denominator is they have it, but they don't practice them. And the thing is, these things got to be practiced. They just equip, it's the equivalent of a fire drill. So when you look at a fire drill, we all know in corporate America, they may run it every quarter. However, on the sports field, man, every day you walk out on the field, it's a potential for a fire. So the thing is, the NFL has, the NFL, NBA, they have all these resources where they can have an hour meeting prior to um, a game, who's going to do what in the event of, However, in sports, when everybody's properly trained, we can have that same type of response with a ten minute with a ten minute meeting, you know, before every practice and every game. That whether we have the resources, whether we don't, because you literally have twenty eight thousand high schools across the United States, and they fall into two buckets: those that have resources, those who don't have resources. And what I mean by resources are those that basically don't have athletic trainers. 
in a lot of schools, even if they have an athletic trainer, if you got one athletic trainer between 10 sports, then you may have five, five games, five different sports going on on one day. What's the real value in that? I mean, you got a greater chance. However, the more educated everybody is, the safer all our kids will be. Marty, I, I'm, I'm sitting there realizing, thinking, looking at my questions and hearing the conversation a little bit more. I apologize in advance. I did both of you guys a disservice because we need more time for this conversation. Oh, it's all good. We can come oh, back. Oh, man. Like, this is this is awesome and fantastic for a couple reasons. Because when you talk about how important the EAP system is, that's a lot of education in that. That's a lot of oh, teaching yeah, of in course. that. And you talked about it earlier about the um, way you teach things and the, and the language Make sure you understand it. Like it's important that folks, when it comes to health safety, health advocacy, that you have a way of delivering good information. You know it's good information. You you know it's important for the community, but you have to find a way to to, to deliver it. And um, I know you guys are constantly doing that, not only professionally but particularly for the youth programs as well. Sure. David, I love the approach that you guys are having for the kids, particularly about not only being a coachable kid but also having the confidence. Because I grew up with some tough coaches. And the minute I thought about talking back to him, I knew I probably was going to get chastised or part of the team or, or, or not play. But we're going to close with this last question. I know you guys got a lot going on, a busy schedule. But, David, how has working with, with the, George Mc, uh, the George McNair Foundation and, and like, let me, let me rephrase that. What, what do you guys want to go forward um, for – communities in the sports field to understand how can you make it important for them to understand the importance of EAPs, the importance of um, being a coachable kid, but also speaking up for yourself. Um, how, how, how important is that to you and, and how are you still delivering that message? Uh, it's, it's crucial. Um, and I think the most important thing is being able to change mindsets because as you stated earlier, you know, when we were coming up you know, in youth sports, we had coaches that, you know, they would discourage us from wanting to go get water. Water was for the week. You know, they would say things like that. And so trying to change the mindset first of the youth to let them know it's OK to not have 100 percent. And it's OK to be able to tell your coach that they're going to know if you're loafing, if you're not giving full effort. But yeah. you have to be able to speak up and say that, you know, and a lot of times, as you said, you know, as, a, as an athlete, you either intimidate it because you don't want to be punished. So that's one thing, trying to get coaches to get away from punishment drills. But also, you don't want to let the team down. You don't want to let the coach down. You don't want to let your parents down. But there's always going to be another step or another play, but there may not be if you don't speak up when you're not feeling well. And so changing the mindset of the youth is important. Changing the mindset of the coaches when it comes to, you know, giving correction to a lack of focus or a misstep, you know, whether it be in practice or a game. Like safety has to be prioritized in the same way, you know, the execution of a play or game plan is. And so that's really where we focused our energy and our efforts is to try to change those mindsets. And it's, it's an obstacle, but it's one that we're willing and able, I think, you know, if we continue to press on and do the work that we'll change those mindsets and we'll keep these student athletes safe. For sure. That's great, man. I, I love it. I know you guys are going to keep pushing and keep delivering this message in the language that folks understand it. Um, you know, it's awesome. So before we go, Marty, what's next for the foundation? Where are you guys? I know we got the CIAA in town here in Baltimore. Are you guys speaking? Where else can we see and find information about what's going on with the George McNair Foundation? Yeah, so uh, actually, man, we're um, <laughs> we're going into year five right now, Rodney. So, you know, this is a crucial year for us. Um, so we're uh, immediately this weekend, we're at uh, out at um, uh, uh, South Baltimore uh, at the What's the name middle of that branch. recreation center, Dave? Middle Branch. Okay. okay. We're at the Middle Branch facility in Cherry Hill uh, Saturday for the uh, CIAA youth kickoff. And basically, everybody can follow us at uh, our Jordan McNair Foundation on uh, Instagram, uh, uh, Twitter, uh, Jordan McNair, LinkedIn, just depending on what level of professionalism you are, you're at in your life. But again, uh, always follow us at the Jordan McNair Foundation.org. And also go to our YouTube page, man, because, you know, we document everything, all of our clinics, all our sports camps. Um, we're working on, um, uh, we just uh, uh, came out of a meeting with uh, uh, Morgan, head coach Damon Wilson at Morgan State University. Uh, hopefully we'll be doing our, our second annual Baltimore Citywide Sports Clinic. 
uh, in May. I mean, uh, June nice. in June, I believe maybe the first week, first or second, second or third week in June. So that's really a big time for us, man. Um, man, like really to give everybody because initially we were doing it at McDonald every year. And man, not only for kids to come out and have fun, but for parents to come out and get educated, man, on what questions you should be asking around yeah. your child's safety. Do not let your student athlete walk on anybody's field, anybody's court without getting the proper information and knowing what questions to ask regarding your student athlete safety. That's awesome, man. I really appreciate the time today, Marty and, and David. Um, thank you for letting us know what's going on with the foundation. And as always, you guys are in my heart. I love the message and I love the, uh, the, the, the tool that you guys are using to get this information out because it's important for the student athlete, for the coach, for the parent, everyone involved in sports where it's okay to say, I don't have it today. And you can still give you 100%. So thanks again, Marty, David. Really appreciate you. Thanks for joining the thanks bridge. And, uh, thanks for having us. Yep. And for having us, right. You're welcome. And I'll talk to you guys later. Okay. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Bridge Podcast. To learn more about the Patience Program, visit our website at www.patience.umaryland.edu.